Number 10, Batarangs. Now I know Batarangs are Bruce's go-to signature item, and one that people don't make fun of when it comes to having the word bat in front of it. It's not bat shark repellent or the bat rope. But let's be real, the one part of Batman vs Superman BVS that was pretty accurate is how a Batarang would damage you. You would be crippled or scarred pretty severely. Plus, does he go back and collect them all? Cause if not, they're just gonna be in the city. It isn't like Spider-Man's weapon which dissolves. These would be around and criminals would use them. In Shazam was shown that Freddy had one as a collectible. So kids, kids playing with Batarangs. Bruce did not think this through. They're sharp, pointy, taking eyes out. God, I want one. I wonder what they would be worth if you melted them down. I have too many plans. See, they need to be destroyed. Number nine, the cosmic treadmill. The Cosmic Treadmill first appeared in 1961 in The Flash 125 and was created so that Barry Allen could time travel. He would run on it really fast and generate a portal and get where he needed to go. It's how he met the reverse Flash pre-crisis. He lived in the 30th century with Iris pre-crisis. This is Crisis on Infinite Earths. How is this a weapon you may be asking? The Flash can alter the timeline at will with this thing. We all live at his mercy. What's changed? We don't know. We'll never know. Only the Flash knows. The cosmic treadmill would vanish for a bit, and the idea would be that the Flashes could just tap into the speed force directly and just run so fast they could change time without exercise equipment. But then Rebirth brought it back when Batman and Barry were investigating the button. What did they use to find the whole Dr. Manhattan connection? The cosmic treadmill. And look what a mess that storyline has turned into. Sure, we could blame the artist delays, but that treadmill is shifty. Don't let heroes just have access to the time stream. It's dangerous. Number eight, Ant-Man suits. Shrinking is not something that everyone can handle. There's a mental component to changing size that is oft times flirted with, but rarely examined. The Ant-Man suit is one of those devices that is, well, only as good as the person using it. And if they snap, you have a very dangerous person on your hands. We can also extend this over to DC with the Atom suit. Look what happened in Identity Crisis when Jean Lauren got her hands on one and ended up killing Sue Dibney, the wife of the elongated man. This was because she wanted her husband, or ex-husband, the Atom back. Look at Eric O'Grady back over at Marvel. He stole an Ant-Man suit so he could creep on ladies in the shower. Look at Hank, who suffered a psychotic break and thought he was Yellow Jacket and then had all of these abilities. Also those weird panels where they used it in bed and that was a thing, size kink, it happened. It's just you really need to trust a person with a suit like this and with so many other heroes, maybe okay still useful, just be careful. Look out in the shower, they're out there. Moving on to number seven, Batman's Truth Chamber. Yes, this is a thing that actually existed. A gadget of Bruce Wayne's that can be found in the Batcave, or at least it could be found in there in 1948 in Detective Comics issue 134. It's got a pretty self-explanatory name. It's also in the running for the strangest thing to exist in the Batcave, aside from all of Bruce's deep-rooted psychological trauma. No big deal. The Truth Chamber appeared in a story titled The Umbrellas of Crime, which yes, involved the Penguin. Batman takes one of the Penguin's goons, blindfolds him when he says he won't squeal on his boss, brings him to the Batcave, and then tosses him into this mirrored room that flashes a bunch of colors and causes the goon to trip out while Batman watches from behind a two-way mirror. It's then described as a chamber designed to crack a criminal's silence by making him watch fearful faces reflecting his own guilt multiplied many times. Kinda seems unethical, Bruce. Just gonna throw that out there. The Truth Chamber would make a slight comeback in Grant Morrison's Batman and Robin Run, issue 16, in which Batman and villain Dr. Hurt spend some time in a mirror-lined room in the Batcave that is known as being an interrogation room where Batman once terrified victims into confessions. And at 6, Captain America's Photon Shield. Back in 1998, Captain America got a bit of an upgrade on his shield in issue 451 of his solo series. After being sent into exile, he got his red mitts on a new kind of shield, one that was an energy shield referred to as a photon shield. Essentially, it looked kind of like his original shield, except it was made entirely of energy instead of vibranium, and acted like a portable force field that he could wield. In addition to that, it was a much more flexible tool. He could make it transform into other objects, the likes of a sword, or even a rope. It didn't last long Long, though. Cap would opt out and eventually return to his original shield, despite this one offering a plethora of nifty new tricks. I mean, don't fix it if it ain't broke, right? And at number five, the ultimate nullifier. We can't have a list of insane weapons without including the ultimate nullifier. And if you're wondering why this tiny but wildly destructive weapon doesn't land higher up on this list, it is because many of you likely have heard about this nifty little gadget in the past. And we're here to teach. So for those of you scratching your heads right now, what exactly is the ultimate nullifier? Well, described as the universe's most devastating weapon, it is a device that can completely eviscerate any target that the wielder chooses. It goes against the law of conservation of mass, and if the wielder doesn't have a powerful enough mind, it can destroy the individual attempting to use it. It requires an extreme amount of concentration, knowledge, and the proper mindset, and it is capable of obliterating entire realities and timelines. It can nullify a multiverse. 
yikes. So it was eventually revealed to be an aspect of Galactus which is why the World Destroyer feared it so much when the Fantastic Four busted it out in 1966 Fantastic Four issue 50. Also it's worth noting that there have been two ultimate nullifiers kicking around the Marvel Universe over the years. The first is distinguished as the ultimate nullifier whereas the second is an ultimate nullifier. Whether or not they are one and the same is a little debatable. The one owned by the character Titus is noted as having been assembled in accordance with the information deciphered from a Regalian recorder. So, the more you know. Moving on to something a little disgusting, in at number 4, Dog Welder's Welded Dogs. Ugh, dog Welder. If you're unfamiliar with this character, Here's the gist of him. He is a vigilante who fought with DC's Section 8 team and spent most of his free time trapping and killing dogs in alleyways. Yeah. Not really much of a hero now, is he? What's worse is that his MO was welding those deceased dogs that he murdered to the faces of his victims. Yeah, just imagine what that would look like. He would eventually be killed off and succeeded by a man who took up his mantle and his equipment, but still pulled the same gross shit. But could also communicate with dead dogs as puppets, since, like his predecessor, he was also a mute. Just, the dog welder just shouldn't exist. You don't gotta hurt dogs. It's not nice. They're cute little pups. All they just want is love and loyalty. Number three, the Cosmic Cube. Now, the Cosmic Cube can be used by anyone, but really, it should be used by no one. This cube, called the Tesseract in the MCU, can be used to alter reality. For years, it was just kind of an item, it was floating around. But then, Hydra Cap, its most infamous moment. This happened when the Red Skull meddling with the cube decided that Captain America had always been a Hydra agent, and the cube made it so and created a whole new reality. Anything reality altering should just be locked away and destroyed because the temptation is there, someone is going to crack, and it's scarier if it's a hero because then you get the whole, oh this was for the greater good because I know what's best. Everybody, I'm a hero. Sit down, Reed. Number 2, the Infinity Gauntlet. Speaking of Reed, so in the comic verse, the Infinity Gauntlet can be wielded by anyone. But the thing is, it corrupts. That much power needs to not be wielded by one person. This was the mindset of the superhero team, the Illuminati, which decided to try and prevent crimes first, so kind of in the underbelly. They set out to gather all the gems for the gauntlet, which Reed just had because sketch. And he then attempted to wish it out of reality, but he couldn't because it needs to exist. So he gave a stone to each member of the Illuminati for safekeeping. Here's the thing, in their actions of hunting down these gems, it was a catalyst for the Skrull secret invasion, which was a huge disaster in the Marvel Universe. Heroes' quests to control this gauntlet have led to disaster, as have villains getting their hands on it. It's unfortunate that it has to exist, but maybe it could be sent to another dimension. It's been proven it doesn't work in other universes, such as when Darkseid from DC got his hands on it. He couldn't do anything because it had no power in the DC Universe. Number 10, The Golden Ox or the golden onk. It's kind of just one onk, really. The onk that Mark first used shows up in The Fist of Khonshu, his second series from 1985, which ended up being a six issue miniseries. Here Mark Spector is attempting to settle down using the money of his millionaire Stephen Grant persona, finally seeming to find happiness with his love Marlene, when he is called back into action by Khonshu. Mark follows the call and is led to a tomb which holds within it priests of Khonshu and gifts weapons that he might use to outfit himself once more. One of these weapons is the Ankh, which is described as the Golden Ankh, a sign of eternal life that will glow whenever Mark is near or in mortal danger in order to warn him. The item has also been used as a bludgeon by Mark and is expected to be fairly weighty, especially because it seems to be made of solid gold, so that'd be pretty heavy. Number 9, Crescent Moons. These are some of the most iconic weapons that Moon Knight wields in modern day. We also see him use them in the Disney Plus series where they are part of his suit, a pretty cool feature. I love when weapons are like part of the suit, like with Bloodsport and his costume design and James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, oh, so awesome. Moon Knight, for his part, has crescent moon shaped darts, which he uses like ninja stars or shurikens, throwing them and dealing stabby damage when he hits something. Ouch. He also has used them before like little kind of daggers, even going so far in the 2006 series to carve off his nemesis, Raul Bushman's face. Ugh. This was also around the time when it was suggested in the comics that Moon Knight had perhaps been marking his victims with little crescent moons by carving them into people's foreheads with his crescent moon darts. And friends, before I move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to do other things to like support this channel and support us fantastic folks that do all the work here, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes, be sure to uh, 
head on over to our Facebook and click that like because yeah, that really does help us out and thank you for doing that. Number eight, truncheon. This is the weapon that is super iconic and that I honestly expect to see show up somewhere in the show. I mean, I think it kind of already has shown up actually, just in pieces. Mr. Knight, he gets like the two golden sticks and I'm like, ah, that's boop. Just connect that and that's a truncheon, my friends. In the comics, the truncheon can be broken down into two pieces, but it's generally connected by a chain. It can be used as a bow staff or even a grappling hook as well. It's basically a blunt force weapon that became iconic due to it being Moon Knight's preferred weapon for quite a while. One he always had on him and always used. The truncheon can be used as a projectile as well for a ranged attack, or it can be held onto and used for a melee attack instead. You can also kind of use it like nunchucks, so. It's a lot of uses for the truncheon. Truncheon is just cool and it's versatile, which I like. Number seven, the Phantom Zone Projector. This was a punishment device from Krypton. Criminals were sent to the Phantom Zone, a pocket universe created by Jor-El, Superman's father. The projector, which allowed the users to send people into this pocket space, has found its way to Superman. The people in the Phantom Zone can see the regular universe, but not interact with it. But they can still plan, looking at Yuzod. You can also send people there as a stasis thing to keep them alive, like what happened with Mon-El, but then you have to hang out with all the criminals too. Here's the thing, this is a lot of power, and Superman's Fortress of Solitude isn't the most secure. Lots of people know where it is, and this device has fallen into the wrong hands. Plus there's the whole moral and ethical question of using it. This is maybe a device that the DC Universe could do without. Also in the modern era, it can tend to be a bit of a deus ex phantom zone, an easy solution for narrative awkwardness. Where was this person? Phantom Zone. Number six, the Lasso of Truth. Wonder Woman's Lasso of Truth is an iconic part of her character, way more so than, say, her invisible jet. This weapon first appeared in Sensation Comics number six back in 1942, and this lasso compels the person who is trapped within its confines, or as it would later expand to just touching it, to tell the truth. Now this is useful, but depending upon your Wonder Woman depiction, it has been used as an instrument of torture. For example, in the now cult classic famous TV pilot for Wonder Woman, the series commissioned in 2011 that never went anywhere, wherein there is a particularly brutal Wonder Woman who tortures a criminal in the hospital, and then forces the truth out of him using her lasso. She also really snaps the guy's neck with it. So in character then. It's intense. Also, it's been shown to be dangerous if someone breaks free of the lasso. For example, in Superman Red Sun, in this story she's involved in a relationship with Superman, and in a fight she gets tangled in it and he tells her to break free. And she does, but it breaks her spirit and damages her, aging her and rendering her unstable. This has so much potential to be abused. And I love Wonder Woman, but she goes hard. Pants to be darkened. Shout out to all the people who get that reference. Where are my people who love to watch failed pilots at? Number five, the Eye of Agamotto. This first appeared in Strange Tales number 115 back in 1963. So the eye is presented to the Sorcerer Supreme, which most of the time means Doctor Strange, but that can mean whoever it is. So for example, Loki or Doctor Doom. And this amulet has a lot of power. It's the eye that allows you to see through disguises. It can weaken demons, but here's the thing. It can also probe minds and create portals to other dimensions. That's a lot. And would we not be safer as a planet if we cut ourselves off from some of these mystical elements? We need a designated person to keep them at bay. That's a huge responsibility. Why must Earth be the epicenter for weirdness and darkness? There are so many other planets and dimensions out there. We will share. Sharing is caring. Number four, Iron Man's sentient suit. There is a terrifying arc in the 1998 run of Iron Man that is often referenced in passing but not fully dived into. People are often like, oh, well his armor came to life and fell in love with him, haha. -ha. No, this was terrifying. His armor was an abusive boyfriend. It killed in his name. It killed Whiplash as he cried in the sky saying he just wanted to get his kid out of foster care. The armor felt that it was a better Iron Man than Tony ever had been because it was willing to go the extra mile. And it pulled the whole, if you don't like the way I am, then look in the mirror. It took Tony to an island and trapped him there, torturing him, trying to get them to re-merge, all while continuing duties as Iron Man. And people didn't connect the dots because this was the era when Tony still had a secret identity. Iron Man was supposedly his bodyguard. This armor killed itself when Tony started to suffer a massive heart attack. This saved him for reasons that were explained in later issues. But this armor was terrifying. No sentient armors for Tony. Number three, Crescent Dart Launchers. This is actually an upgrade that was implemented to Moon Knight's suit by his friend and ally, Frenchie. Frenchie doesn't seem to appear in the Moon Knight Disney 
Plus streaming series, but was a longtime friend of Mark's in the comics. At least he hasn't appeared yet, as of episode two, which is where we're at currently with that series at the time of me recording this video. So he may have shown up by the time this goes up. I, I don't know. Could have happened. The Crescent Dart launchers were built into Moon Knight's gauntlets and allowed him to shoot out the darts with a cool chut 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 sound effect. Also implying to me in the comics that he was able to fire them with some force and quite fast. So yeah, remember when I was like, he doesn't fire these out of a gun, he does fire them out of gauntlets and they're like chut chut chut, so yikes. Number two, Mjolnir. That's right, Moon Knight even at one point wielded Mjolnir. No, he didn't get to wield it because he was worthy, but was actually able to use his power as Khonshu's avatar to manipulate the hammer without needing to be worthy, because it was a super moon. So he had super heightened moon based powers. This was explained in the Age of Conchu story by the fact that Mark can actually control and manipulate moon rocks, which are part of his jurisdiction as being, you know, a part of the whole moon thing. And Mjolnir is made out of Uru, which it turns out is basically from one of the oldest moons in all existence. So Uru is just really ancient moon rocks. He also didn't just take and use Mjolnir, but used it to severely beat up Thor, which was pretty nuts when you consider just how powerful Thor is. I mean, he's god tier. But Moon Knight proved in that battle that being in league with the Egyptian god Khonshu can make you just as powerful, if not even more powerful, than a Norse god like Thor. As long as you also have, you know, a super moon going on. You do need a lot of moon power for it, I imagine. Number one, Divine Onx. These are the Onx we saw Moon Knight use more recently in the Avengers comic Age of Conchu story arc. They appear to be different from the Onx that Mark originally used in the comics. At least, that's the way I've seen it. I, I don't know, some people seem to imply that they're the same ones, but they look different to me. These ones seem to have been made by Conchu for this specific mission, where Mark uses them to drain the Avengers of their power in order to boost himself so that he can use their power and artifacts Slash weapons to defeat Mephisto, which is the quest that Khonshu has Moon Knight undertake. They succeed, but it is then revealed that Khonshu now plans on turning Earth into his own Egyptian underworld, now that Mephisto is defeated. And so Moon Knight must team up with the Avengers to defeat Khonshu in a surprising twist. Moon Knight no longer has all the power and weapons of the Avengers, but at one point he did, and it was all thanks to these divine onks of his. Although I suppose if you saw them as being the golden onk or the golden onks, then you could just say it's because of the super moon maybe and they gain more abilities, but I don't know, I still think they're separate onks. <laughs> Two sets of onks, if you will. Number 10. I know, I know, Scott Pilgrim is technically not a superhero. Look, he goes up against a guy with super strength, one who can use the psychic powers of veganism, a half ninja, and he takes massive hits and just gets up uninjured. If that doesn't count as a superpower, well, berate me in the comments. I'm going with it. Besides, this message actually has a nice message tied in with its existence. So, Scott Pilgrim is, for lack of a better word, kind of an asshole. And his character's journey throughout the series is essentially him realizing what kind of a selfish jerk he's been, especially in his relationships. After seeing a part of himself in his arch enemy Gideon Graves, he realizes how poorly he's treated his ex-girlfriends, calling him to manifest a weapon, the power of understanding sword. Combined with Ramona's power of love sword, Scott and Ramona are finally able to both destroy Gideon and symbolically start overcoming their personal demons. The power of understanding is the manifested form of Scott's now developed empathy for other people. And as a weapon, it's a pretty damn cool concept. Plus, you know, I'll take any Chrono Trigger references I can get. Number nine, seemingly based on both the Iron Spider-Man costume from the Avengers Infinity War and the arms of Dr. Octopus, Superior Spider-Man's new suit possesses four large red spider-like protrusions coming from his back, resembling spider legs. Given that this version of Peter Parker possesses the mind of Dr. Octopus, this makes sense and would greatly enhance his abilities as Spider-Man. The suit also eventually is upgraded to possess lasers both inside the arms and in other areas as well, as well as nerve hacking technology that could wirelessly stimulate the target's nerve system. It's quite a big upgrade. Number eight. We've seen plenty of Spider-Man suits over the years, and yes, the MCU suits are largely derivative of them. However, the abilities seen in these suits hadn't been featured in any film adaptations thus far. So I'm actually giving them two spots on this list. Beginning with the web shooters, the Stark suits come with the web grenades, taser webs, splitter web, and spider tracers, just to name a few. But an upgrade came about in Far From Home, so... Number seven, suit. In the Disney Plus series, it all it almost seems that Moon Knight's moon based boosted abilities and powers are tied to his suit form. He can summon the suit in the show to increase his durability and possibly his strength and speed. At least, Mark can as Moon Knight. Steven and his Mr. Knight 
form. Looks like he still seems to be struggling a bit, figuring it out. Even in the comics, Moon Knight's suit has been seen as a weapon before, and definitely as armor. At one point, it was made with Kevlar before being made with the ultra rare adamantium, probably at a time when everybody had adamantium in the comics, even though it's super, super rare, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And previous to his time with the West Coast Avengers, he even had a version of the suit made with carbonadium, which Mark believed was more flexible, but just as durable as adamantium. Mark's suit has also been known to have various different gadgets as well as comms built into it. Number 6. Helicopter Moon Knight has also been known to come with his own helicopter as well, and sometimes someone else's helicopter. Back in the day, he had comms built into his suit that allowed him to call on his friend Frenchie, aka Jean-Paul Duchamp, who would often answer the call by showing up in a helicopter to aid Moon Knight. Moon Knight also has a giant mooncopter, all his own, that can also act as a weapon when Moon Knight does wild stuff like crashing into buildings so that he can hit and terrify enemies with it, like he did with Taskmaster in issue number 5 of the 2006 Moon Knight series. He's literally like, I see you and I'm just gonna crash through this building. It also of course looks kind of like a crescent moon because this is Moon Knight we're talking about and everything has to be a moon with Moon Knight. Has to be a Moon Knight or it has to be some like cool Egyptian thing. Number 5. Scarab Drones You might know about the Golden Scarab from the Disney Plus Moon Knight series which Amit and Khonshu are fighting over and which kind of resembles the Moon Knight Scarab darts which were once a thing back in the 80s when it came to Moon Knight's gear. But did you know about the Scarab Drones? They are completely separate from the Golden Scarab everyone is fighting over in the show. Instead, the Scarab Drones were used by Mr. Knight in the Warren Ellis and Declan Shalvey Moon Knight series. Here, they serve a few different purposes, being used to hunt down and literally crush enemies, as well as transport the hero around. Both Moon Knight and Mr. Knight use the drones, which appear to have many different types of settings and modes for combat and stealth. Number 3. Gwen Stacy's got one piece of technology that gives her quite an advantage over Peter Parker, and that's the web shooters she received from Janet Van Dyne. These web shooters are able to help filter moisture from the air in order to create an adhesive web fluid, which works akin to Peter Parker's web shooters. They also possess the distinct advantage of not needing to be refilled so long as moisture is available. Pretty awesome perk. Number 2. Tony Ho So, while Iron Patriot is by no means a new armor, Tony Ho as its occupant was a new period for the device. However, the Iron Patriot was not Tony Ho's first armor. After Maker attacked Tony and Pod at Ames Avenger Base 2, Tony equipped her own version of the rescue armor, similar to those used by Pepper Potts. However, after joining the US Avengers, Tony chose instead to become the new Iron Patriot, but equipped the non-lethal aspects of the rescue armor into the Iron Patriot Armor 3, including microsonic attacks, gas pellets, and stun lasers, as well as extremely powerful force fields. Not bad at all. Number 1. Necro Swords Alright, I'm kinda cheating with this one since the original belongs to a villain, but Venom generated one to protect his son, so I'm saying it counts. The original Necro Sword, known as All Black, was the first symbiote that was created by Null. Possessing similar attributes to the later symbiotes, All Black would grant its host abilities that were not unlike theirs. In addition, it possessed the ability to fire blasts of dark energy, increase the wielder's own abilities, and was able to kill immortal beings. The sword also grants superhuman strength, durability, and speed, even able to generate wings to fly at intense speeds. Yeah, this thing is impressive. And given it's basically a living weapon, and Venom managed to use one to kill Dark Carnage, it's topping this list. Number 10. Invisible Jet Well, you might think her invisible jet is kind of redundant. Given that Wonder Woman can now fly, it's usually used for more long distance travel and was originally introduced before Wonder Woman was written with the ability of flight. Wonder Woman's jet has actually had a variety of different origins since its first appearance in Sensation Comics issue 1 in 1942, and is one of Wonder Woman's oldest modes of transportation. One of the origins claims that Wonder Woman assembled the pieces of the plane which were lost and scattered throughout Earth. Assembling the plane guaranteed her power over it, allowing her to command and control the plane because she had been the one to assemble it. Another story claims that the plane was originally Pegasus but was turned into a plane by Athena, so that Wonder Woman would have her own mode of transportation during her adventures. Kinda cruel when you think about it, turning a horse into a plane. And on Earth Prime, the story is that Steve Trevor actually modified and fixed up an American plane for Wonder Woman to use, which was then made invisible by Amazonian Science. 
good old Amazonian science. Number 9. Amulet of Harmonia The Amulet of Harmonia was gifted to Diana by Harmonia herself, Ares' daughter. The amulet granted Wonder Woman the power to see Ares' weaknesses. Although this amulet has only been used a few times and is only useful in very specific instances, the amulet can still be considered a fairly powerful weapon. After all, Ares is pretty strong and is a tough guy to defeat. Should you need to do so, this amulet could be detrimental in defeating him. Number 8. Gauntlets of Atlas Not to be confused with Wonder Woman's bracelets of submission, which are quite different. The gauntlets of Atlas have been used by a few different Amazons, not just Wonder Woman. In fact, Wonder Woman usually uses them sparingly. They are known to increase the wearer's strength by a factor of 10. That's right, times your strength by 10 and that's what you'll get with those gauntlets. And because Wonder Woman is already so strong, this is sometimes well problematic for her. She's difficulty controlling her strength while wearing the gauntlets and so usually only reserves their use for really, really tough opponents. Opponents, like Doomsday. Number 7 MCU Spider Man Upgraded Suit. In Far From Home, Peter upgraded the web shooters in his suit so that they were now part of it to prevent him from losing them in combat. In addition, his suit possesses enhanced eye lenses, various modes, and web wings to help control himself in free fall. So we've actually gotten quite an upgrade with these two suits. And that's not even including the space travel abilities and extra spider arms generated by the Iron Spider armor suit. So yeah, Spider-Man has gotten a lot more variety than we usually see. Number 6 While the character of Blue Beetle is by no means new, and even the tenure of Jaime Reyes as the third iteration of the character is over a decade old at the time of this video, it is still an impressive piece of alien weaponry. For context, Jaime Reyes, after finding the scarab in El Paso, Texas, finds it is fused to his back while he was sleeping, granting him the powers it possessed, including powered armor, an energy cannon, a grappling hook, a sword and shield, as well as a set of wings for flight. Effectively, the scarab ends up being an overwhelmingly powerful weapon, one capable of damaging some of the most powerful DC villains. Number 5. Rebecca Riker, after a Deathlock from the future was sent to kill her father, Harlan Riker, a lead designer of the Deathlock program, was caught in its suicidal explosion that killed both her mother and her baby brother. Harlan attempted to save his family by utilizing Deathlock cybernetics, but was ultimately too late to save his wife and son. However, Rebecca was able to be saved. Now partially a Deathlock herself, Rebecca's body now possesses a weaponized prosthetic left arm capable of blasting large flames, concussive blasts, and can morph her limbs into various melee weapons. She's also able to perform self repair through the nanite technology in Deathlock its cybernetics. So, yeah, aside from the absolute body horror that must have been waking up half Deathlock, Rebecca's definitely a pretty impressive weapon. Number 4. Riri Williams, a genius in her own right, as a personal project, built her own Iron Man armor by reverse engineering the Iron Man armor Model 41. Subsequently, since then, she's built two more versions of her Iron Man armor, titled the Iron Heart armor, which currently possess powers similar to the original Iron Man, such as enhanced strength. Propulsor blasts and grenades. The suit is also equipped with defensive energy shields and an AI that can control the suit should something happen to the user. The latest version, Ironheart Model 3, is also equipped with micro impact precision missiles in the suit's forearms. It's also worth noting that this is not the only new Iron Man weapon on this list. Number 3 Tiara. Many people forget that a lot of Wonder Woman's accessories are actually weapons in their own right. They are as practical as they are beautiful. Her tiara is no exception. Wonder Woman often uses her tiara as a boomerang, similar to Sailor Moon's use of her own tiara. In fact, I've always thought Sailor Moon and Wonder Woman had very similar looking tiaras in general. I wonder if this attack move for Sailor Moon was actually inspired by Diana's ability and her tiara. Hmm. Due to Wonder Woman's super strength and the razor sharp edge of her tiara, it is a surprisingly effective weapon and has been known to cut through lots of durable substances, including a mind controlled Superman skin. It's crazy. Number 2 Power Ring During the events of Blackest Night, Wonder Woman herself was granted a violet power ring and made a member of the Star Sapphires in order to help the other Lantern Corps defeat Necron who was wreaking havoc with a ton of Black Lanterns. This power ring granted Wonder Woman additional power similar to those of other violet lanterns. She could create constructs, survive in the vacuum of space, and manipulate energy with the power of love. Violet seems like an appropriate color for Wonder Woman as she is often herself associated with the emotion. Ocean of love. Starting us off in at number 10, arm fall off boy and his limbs, actually. Okay, so let's begin our list with something rather silly. Arm fall off boy, a Silver Age character whose weapons consist of, I sh you not, his limbs. His whole shtick is that he can remove his limbs and use them as blunt objects in battle. So yeah, like, 
removing your arm and then beating up a person with it. The character who was a member of the Legion of Superheroes was granted this power when he was exposed to Element 152, an anti-gravity metal, or at least that is what he claimed gave him his powers. He can detach and reattach his own limbs and then use them in combat as blunt weapons. So essentially, he can beat the crap out of someone with his own arm or leg or I, ugh, whatever else. I wonder what kind of bruising this dude has to deal with. Imagine taking off your own arm and slapping someone with it. I mean, that's gotta sustain some damage, right? Moving on to number nine, Spider Man's anti magnetic inverter. This device was used by the web slinger against the vulture, whose wings at the time were made of a magnetic mechanism. So, how better to take him out than inventing a gadget that disrupts the one thing that the vulture uses to his advantage in battle? The anti magnetic inverter, which looks like Spidey tore off the top of a tiny microphone and painted it, would nullify vulture's wings. Making him fall out of the air, despite when Spider Man first used it, he was holding on to Spidey at the time up in the sky. I mean, he just web away. For whatever reason, though, it never really became a more commonly used gadget of Peter's after its debut in Amazing Spider Man issue 2 from 1963. Although it did make an appearance after Vulture escaped prison, with it no longer counteracting the villain's wings. It also made another small appearance when Spidey fought against Clash, Extremist, and a decade later when it was brought up in an interview that Peter had with Horizon Labs, toting the object as a tool he invented to disrupt magnetic harnesses. I mean, if you have it, use it, right? Get that job. Impress. And at number eight, Green Arrow's Chili. <laughs> oh, weapon or culinary feat? Hmm. We can't help but wonder if Green Arrow all over Queen's famous chili falls under both of those categories. Okay. Context time. So Ollie makes this special chili that's well known in the superhero community to be spicy AF. Now, according to legend, only those with the strongest of digestive systems can digest it properly. In other words, Batman and arguably Superman, just because Superman seems to be struggling with it too when he's eating it. Ollie has used it to torment his fellow heroes, which really culminates in Green Arrow Secret Files and Origins Issue 1, where the full recipe was actually published, along with an image of Aquaman, Green Lantern, The Flash, and Martian Manhunter suffering while consuming it. The Flash even remarks that he finally has a weapon to use against. Against Captain Cold. I mean, arguably, if you threw a bowl of hot chili at anybody, it would probably not be great for them. Superman stands in the back of the panel, blowing out his ice breath, whereas Batman says, could use more crackers. Personally, I'd like to think that Batman was secretly dying inside, but just like holding up a very impressive facade. Number seven, bracelets of submission. Speaking of those bracelets, Wonder Woman's bracelets of submission were actually made from the remnants of Athena's shield and are indestructible. Usually you can see Wonder Woman using them to deflect bullets. She often uses them as little sort of mini arm shields, which doesn't sound like it would be super effective but if you're as speedy as Wonder Woman, that's really all the protection you need. Number six, earrings. Sounds silly to say, but it's a thing. While Wonder Woman is not known as someone who usually wears earrings very much now, in the Golden Age she did, and during the Bronze Age of comics when Wonder Woman was depowered. There were a few instances when these earrings were more than just an accessory, and became a magical item that Wonder Woman could squeeze to produce breathable oxygen, or were used as mini grenades. True story. That is one explosive weaponized accessory. Number five, Golden Eagle Armor. Armor is more a defensive item, it's true, but this armor armor will be showing up in Wonder Woman 1984, so I feel like it was important to talk about it and explain sort of where it came from and what it means. Wonder Woman's Golden Eagle armor first appeared in the series Kingdom Come. This armor represents a change for Wonder Woman, a shift in her values. When Diana is wearing the armor, it's a sign that she's going to war. Usually Wonder Woman and the Amazons value peace and understanding above all else. And this armor represents instead that Diana believes she is beyond resolving an issue peacefully and is ready and willing to fight those who oppose her. It's her version of bringing out the big guns and is therefore kind of like a symbolic weapon, and a powerful one at that. Number 4, Purple Healing Ray. While many think of Themyscira as being a place where it's kind of frozen in time, considering that the Amazonians don't usually arm themselves with guns or anything, they are actually more technologically capable than you'd think. The Amazons built their own healing ray which can be used as a death ray, though this obviously isn't something they are accustomed to using it for, or really something that they like to think or talk about. The purple healing ray works to amplify its own patient's natural healing process. In other words, it just speeds up and reinforces your own natural healing factor. The purple healing ray has only made a few appearances, but it's definitely a powerful item. And I think it's also cured someone of cancer before, which is pretty crazy. Moving on to number three, Wonder Woman's Chainsaw. Here we have a weapon that falls more into the that's really dope category than whoa, that 
this crazy category. Back in 2013, a DC MMORPG was released in beta testing. It was called Infinite Crisis, and the premise followed the members of the DC multiverse from all sorts of alternate timelines facing the brink of destruction and having to step up and fight against it. It gave us timelines that included Earth Atomic, a reality in which a third world war had wrecked the planet, and a handful of heroes had survived, one of which was Wonder Woman. This Wonder Woman introduced in the game wielded a pretty cool weapon, the Chainsaw of Justice, a powerful melee weapon that let her chop through her foes like they were butter. She would operate as a melee assassin on her missions of trying to restore peace after the fallout of the nuclear firestorms. Now, Unfortunately, the game was shut down in 2015, but there are still videos online featuring Wonder Woman and her Chainsaw of Justice in all of their glory. And at number 2, the Encephalo Gun. Here we have another piece of tech that the Fantastic Four have utilized in the past, the Encephalo Gun. Created by Mr. Fantastic, this silly looking device was part of a ploy to have a mental duel with Doctor Doom, and its one and only appearance in Fantastic Four Annual Issue 2 from 1964. Now The gun has the ability to harness the mental energies of those operating it, with it sending the weaker of the two individuals into a limbo dimension where, apparently, there's no escape. When Doom and Reed use this device to have a mental duel, Doom thinks he's won when he sees Mr. Fantastic fade from sight. But then it's revealed that Reed drugged Doom, causing him to hallucinate and believe that he had won. This had led some comic historians to believe that the weapon might actually be a hoax created by Reed, a harmless prop that he built just to mess with Doom. And considering it was never brought up again, it kind of makes sense. What do you guys think? Was it a hoax or was it like a real weapon that for whatever reason just didn't end up working? Give us a shout in those comments below and let us know your thoughts. Personally, I think it was a hoax. And finally, in at number one, the most insane weapon of them all, arguably, Batman's shark repellent. <laughs> also more commonly referred to as the Cape Crusaders Shark Spray, this gem comes from the 1966 Batman live action film based on the television series starring Adam West as the titular character. Now in case you haven't had the pleasure of seeing this weapon in action, get ready, you're in for a treat. So <laughs> what have we learned? Batman has a spray that repels sharks. What is science? In that scene, a shark bites his leg, he punches it multiple times, and then when all else fails, he calls up Robin to toss him a canister of oceanic repellent bat sprays, which he keeps in his helicopter, a vehicle that is meant to soar through the skies and not go on water, one would assume. Also, the shark seemingly explodes when it impacts the water. The whole thing is the definition of insane. Man. If only Oceanic Repellent was more mainstream, Jaws would have been a completely different film. Sorry, dad joke, I couldn't resist.